I could get it in reverse. What is going on you guys and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm just gonna cut straight to the point. We gotta put a new clutch in the Civic. I was driving on the highway the other day and then I went to downshift into fourth, completely locked me out of gear. So I had to limp it home, pretty much grinding through gears the whole way home. I am 95% sure my throw up bearing is grenaded. So I'll pop a sound clip up. Whenever I heel toe this thing, load it up with the brake on and let the clutch out slowly, this throw up bearing sounds gnarly. Oh yeah, she sounds bad. But I don't have a car to drive right now because the Miata is a Miata and good luck driving that in the winter with an open diff. The Subaru is almost ready to run, but I really do not want to drive this car in the winter. So all we got to do is get a clutch in the Civic and then I should have a car to drive again. I already know this is going to suck to do because it's an eighth gen Civic and the engine bays on these things are super tight, but it's got to be done. So let's just get straight into it. I'm pretty sure we're going to be dropping this thing out of the bottom of the car. So I got to get the front of the car jacked up. But before we do that, I want to show you guys what clutch I went with. And this is actually pretty sick because I chose the clutch that you guys told me to go with. Everybody says, this is the best clutch on the market for the Civic if you want to make some sauce. And we're definitely going to make some sauce because I'm probably going to be boosting this thing this summer. So I went ahead and picked up a competition stage four six puck clutch. This is probably going to be a pain in the ass to daily, but we're going to daily it. So let's get this thing opened up. All right, what do we got in here? Instructions for adjusting pedal travel. We'll have to do that after we finish getting the clutch in. Because it is a six buck heavier duty pressure plate, you definitely want to adjust your clutch pedal free play. First thing we got in the package, throw up bearing, pilot bushing, and our clutch alignment tool. Next, we got our six puck clutch, baby. Oh, this thing's gonna chatter so bad. But she'll hold the sauce. Next, we got our pressure plate. This is what's gonna make the clutch pedal hard. Sick, that should be pretty much it. Did it come with any grease? It should've. What the shit? Where's the grease? We got a sticker, but no grease. Whatever, we'll figure that out later. I'm gonna start by taking everything on the top that I can apart. Now, I've never done this before, so you guys are gonna have to bear with me, but I'm gonna try and make as much of a how-to video as I can, because as always, we're gonna figure it out. We're gonna start by pulling the air box off. You're gonna wanna disconnect your mass sensor up top here. You can just unplug. There's a body clip on that. You can just pop that off. Pull the wire harness off of the intake tube. You're gonna need a 10 mil socket to pull the hose clamp off of each end of the intake tube. You're gonna pop all the clips off of your air box. And then there's gonna be a 10 mil bolt on the air box here. And another 10 mil bolt right on the back there. Look at me, I'm already missing stuff. So on this air box, on the bottom side of the air box, there is a bolt there, a nut here that was mounted on the stud, and then another bolt down on the bottom side, just get a long extension with a 10 mil, and you can zip that guy out on the right side of it. There's also a couple hoses that go to the intake tube, which are pretty self-explanatory. Just grab some pliers, squeeze the hose clamp, and then pop those guys off. There was two of them. And now let's get the battery out. So on the battery, you're gonna have a 10 mil on the negative post. You're gonna wanna disconnect your negative post first. Then you can take the 10 mil off the pop Positive, take the positive post off and then you're gonna have two 10 mils on the J hooks for the battery mount All right, next thing we're gonna do is get that lower intake tube out. There's two 10 mil bolts that mounted to that bracket there and you just gotta disconnect the harness off of the bracket as well. And then I think there's one electrical connector there to undo too. Holy man, that mount is rough, she's rusty. I'm gonna try taking this other 10 mil off on the side here. Oh, there we go. And that wire connector right there, there's just gonna be a clip on the bottom. It's kind of hard to show, but you're just gonna push it in. And I just dropped the bolt, sick. Push it in and push it up and out or down. Next thing I'm gonna do is get this module pulled out. Disconnect this not 12 mil bolt on the bottom. I don't know what size that is. Like a 14, maybe. Oh Lord. Oh 
Oh, there we go. Two 10 mils on this side. And then another 10 mil on this side. Now, what else is holding you? Gotta be a way to take this cover off. Oh, it literally just slides off, sick. Now we're just gonna disconnect the connectors on the back of the module. All you're gonna do is push down on the pin and then pull this lock back and you do that on all three of them and it should come right out. Then since I know that that bracket's gonna get annoying right there, I wanna take that out. So all I gotta do to get this bracket out, we already took the one bolt out on the bottom. There's another bolt in under the fuse box right there. And then there's one tucked in behind the fuse box back there, which you can't get at with the fuse box in place. There's three tabs, one here, you're just gonna pull that tab back and then lift the fuse box up and it should come right off. And then there's two more at the back, one there, and you can't see it, but one right there. So you're just gonna pull those tabs, lift up the fuse box, move it over to the side, and then you can get at the bolt in the fender there. Oh, the bolt back there is a 10 mil. And then just so that I don't have to slide those two clips off the linkage, there's a 12 mil bolt there, and then there's two 12 mil bolts under that boot. So I'm gonna get those taken out, that way those brackets are loose. And we're gonna slide these pins off the linkage, and then hopefully this should lift up and that should slide off and it should all be loose. I think, let's give it a try. Hey, I was right, it just slides right off. Don't lose these clips. Now we are going to disconnect this little solenoid connector here. And then there's one on the front on the bottom down here. Now that we got that guy disconnected, I'm just gonna pop off any of the body clips that are holding the harness to the transmission. There's one green one here, and then that gray one right there. And then just because I know this is gonna be a pain when we go to drop the transmission out the bottom, I'm gonna get that bracket right there that's used for securing the air box taken off. There's just one little clip for the main harness right here that you can pop off. And then there's three little 10 mil bolts on the back side of the transmission. Next thing we're gonna disconnect is the little, I believe it's a transmission fluid temp sensor that sits right under the harness down there. You can just squeeze that connector, lift it up, and get her unplugged. The next thing I'm gonna do, since I don't really wanna have to drain all of the brake fluid and have to re-bleed the clutch again, I'm gonna take this bolt off of the mount for the line that goes to the slave cylinder. That way it's gonna leave that soft line down here loose. And then we're gonna take the bolts right off the slave cylinder right there, the two 12 mil bolts on the top, and see if we can have the slave nice and loose and tuck it over to the side on this battery tray up here. and then we can lay this off to the side. That way we don't have to drain any of the clutch fluid and we don't have to bleed the lines again. Sick. Next thing we gotta disconnect, I just realized there's a 10 mil ground right here. We're just gonna take the ground strap off of the transmission. We can leave it bolted to the body on the other side. Okay, now let's see what our throw up bearing is doing in there with our clutch fork. You should be able to move it side to side like that a little bit, but you should not be able to move it up and down. Holy shit. Oh! My God, there's no freaking way, dude. If you guys look inside there, you can see the clutch fork. I bet you I could pull that clutch fork right out right now. The little circlip that holds on the clutch fork, that circlip right there is supposed to be clipped into the clutch fork. And it is literally just chilling in there, completely loose. I can move the whole thing. Oh, now it's gone. What the hell? If that's all this was, I might cry. A little bit. But we're gonna boost this thing eventually, so I gotta put a clutch in it anyways. So she can handle the sauce. All right, let's keep ripping this thing apart. Now the next thing, and probably honestly the last thing we need to do up top here, is get the bell housing bolts out that bolt the transmission to the engine. Now on the top, I think there's only two up here. There's another one that bolts the transmission to the engine down on the bottom by the mount down there. But up top here, there's gonna be two 17 mil bolts. I pop these two clips off on this engine harness mount here just to give myself a little bit more space. But if you you can see down there, there's one hidden on the back side right there. It's a 17 mil, which is just right down there. And then there's another one right here. And I doubt you guys are gonna be able to see that because it's kind of buried, but it sits right down here by this upper rad hose right under this hard coolant pipe. So let's get those two taken out real quick. Oh my Lord, she's tight. Woo! 
Ow. All right, now that we got both of those two 17 mil bell housing bolts taken out of the top, we pretty much have everything up top that we need taken off other than the one engine mount, but I don't want to take that off until we have some kind of support on the transmission. So let's get the car on jack stands in the front, jacked all the way up as high as we possibly can because we're going to need a lot of space to drop the transmission and I think we got to drop the subframe too out the bottom. All right, so we caught the car up in the air, wheels are off. Now we gotta start getting ready to pull the subframe. So first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna start on the driver's side because it's the axle that is easier to pop out. We're gonna start by taking the axle nut off. And these axle nuts actually have a stake in them. If you could see right there, just where the nut is kind of pounded into the axle, we're gonna need to destake that first. And to destake it, all I use is just a punch and then you can grind a little angled tip into your punch. And then you're just gonna set the punch right in the stake and you're gonna hit it with a hammer until that indent is popped out so you can zip the axle nut back. Before you go ahead and zip that axle nut off, that's about what it should look like when it's destaked. Now we're gonna take a big impact and a 36 mil socket and we're gonna buzz that axle nut off. I already sprayed it down with some penetrating fluid. I would recommend you guys do the same so you don't pull threads out. Wow, that actually went pretty good. Sick. Now that we got that axle nut off, I'm just gonna take a regular round punch and I'm gonna tap the axle to make sure that it's free. And there we go, it's pounded back as far as that CV joint will move and I can push the axle, it's nice and free inside the hub. Now let's move on to getting the lower control arm disconnected and the outer tie rod. And I'll show you guys why I'm doing it this way in a sec, but basically the sway bar is connected to the entire subframe so you don't have to touch anything on that. You can unbolt the control arm, unbolt the tie rod from the whole steering knuckle assembly and then you can drop the subframe. You do not have to disconnect the brake line, you don't have to disconnect the wheel speed sensor. You can leave basically this entire assembly bolted up to the strut so it can stay on the car and then that tie rod the sway bar and the lower control arm are all going to drop when you drop the subframe the one thing i am unsure of with this is it does have electronic power steering and the rack is bolted to the subframe so i'm not 100 sure if you can unbolt the rack from the subframe and then drop the subframe and leave the rack hanging there by the steering shaft or if you have to disconnect the steering shaft and drop the rack with the subframe which would suck but i'm sure we'll figure it out anyways first things first we're going to get this tie rod disconnected from the steering knuckle. There is a cotter pin that holds it there, so you're just gonna bend those prongs straight, pull the cotter pin out, and then I believe it's a 17 mil nut on the top, but I'm just gonna zip that out with an impact. All right, so I was able to get the nut off. I wasn't able to actually pull the cotter pin out, but I ended up just bending it until it broke, pounded a socket over top, and zipped the nut right off. Another thing I took out was the two nuts and the one bolt on the lower control arm. That way you don't have to take the ball joint to the steering knuckle. You can just take those three bolts out, and then the control arm you can pry loose of the steering knuckle itself, which was this bolt and these two nuts right here. Now I'm gonna show you guys how to get this tie rod disconnected from the steering knuckle because you're not gonna be able to get it off there by hand. So you can take a hammer and tap the top very lightly. If it doesn't move, then stop. So I'm gonna try that quick because you don't wanna wreck the threads. I gave it a couple good wax there and it's not moving. So what you're gonna do is you're actually gonna hit the outside of the knuckle and that's gonna free up anything that's locked inside there. Now you're gonna give it another tap from the top. Just like that, she comes right loose. And we didn't damage anything on the tie rod itself. Now, as you can see on the axle there, as I push it in and out, it's nice and loose in the hub. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get a pry bar, shove it into the control arm there. We're gonna pry down on the control arm so it separates that ball joint. And now this whole assembly is loose. And now we can pull the axle out. Push it forward, pull the knuckle out, and lift the axle out of the knuckle. Then you can turn your knuckle all the way over, and now we can pop this axle out. Now showing you guys how to pop this axle out is actually gonna be really hard under the car, but basically you're gonna get a pry bar, and you're gonna shove it between the axle and the transmission case, and you're just gonna pry it till it pops out. It's just held in by a little clip inside the differential of the transmission, so it should pop out pretty easy. So just to show you guys what I was talking about, you're gonna get the pry bar, shove it between the axle and the transmission, and then you're gonna pry it out. Make sure you got a ice cream pail or a drain bucket, because you're probably gonna leak some gear oil out out of the transmission when you pop it out and make sure to catch your axle when it pops so that you don't wreck the axle seal. 
Whoa, that came out really fast. Nice. This was the little clip I was talking about on the axle itself that secures it to the differential and the transmission. So now you guys can see we got this whole steering knuckle assembly and rotor and the whole strut brake line and the wheel speed sensor and the caliper and everything completely loose from the subframe. And all the subframe components are loose on their own, ready to get dropped. Now let's do the same thing on the other side. So this is what the whole axle setup looks like on the right side of the car. It's basically a straight shaft that comes out of the transmission, goes to a steady bearing, and then from there is the rest of the axle to the hub assembly. There's also this plastic cover that sits over top of the axle, but we gotta take that off too. So I'm not gonna be able to show much of this, but I'll time lapse through it, because it's gonna be way too hard to film it. There's just not enough space to fit the camera down there. Okay, I had to stop the time lapse here to show you guys the setup that I got to get this back bolt out on that steady bearing because that is absolutely horrible. So I got a 14 mil on there with a 3 8 swivel. And then coming out behind the subframe, I have two extensions to a 3 8 ratchet. I felt pretty sick that I thought of this, not gonna lie. So let's get this bolt out and then let's get that axle pulled out. All right, so I got the axle out and there actually was one more bolt on the top. That one wasn't too bad to get out. I just ran the same thing, two extensions and a swivel with a 14 mil shallow 3.8 socket. Once you get all three of those out, you can literally slide the axle right out. You don't have to use a pry bar or anything like you had to on the other axle because there's no clip holding that one into the differential because the steady bearing holds it in place when it's bolted up to the back of the engine. So sick, we got both axles out now. What I want to do ideally is unbolt the subframe, drop it a little bit and then unbolt the the rack from the subframe so that I can leave the rack chill up on the car and then just drop the subframe because I really, really do not want to disconnect that steering shaft. But if I have to, it is what it is. So yeah, she's starting to look pretty empty. We're getting there. First thing I got to do before I start taking bell housing bolts out is get that little inspection cover off. There's just those two 10 mils that are right there. Then for bell housing bolts, this is the front of the transmission. You're going to have one bell housing bolt right there, which in case you guys can't tell, it's that one right there. Then you're going to have another one right on the bottom under that inspection cover there. It's another 14 mil. Then on the back side of the transmission, there's a couple big boys. There's a 17 mil right there and another 17 mil up top right there. And that's pretty much it for just bell housing bolts on the bottom. One thing that I am unsure of, and there's no way you guys are gonna be able to see this. You can kind of see it there, but you see that little Honda logo there. That's actually your starter. And I'm not sure if the starter bolts through the engine block to the transmission, but there is that one big bolt there. I'm pretty sure that one goes through. I'm not sure about the one on the top. If there is one on the top, that is gonna be be really, really shitty. So I'm gonna start by getting the rest of the bolts out and then we'll get to that starter after. That sucked. I ended up taking the starter bolt out. You need a short 3 8 ratchet and a deep 17 mil to get in there. So we just took out that big starter bolt on the bottom right there is a big 17 mil and it sits right up by that bracket up there. We took out the 14 mil there, the 14 mil right there and both 17 mils on the back side of the engine. Now the next thing that we're gonna do is get this mount taken off of the transmission which is a 17 mil right there. There's another 17 mil right up there. You have to pull that bolt out from the bolt side. You can't unbolt it from the nuts side over here. There's no way I'm going to be able to show you guys, but that nut actually has a little locking tab on it and you can't see it from here. But trust me, do not try to take that off or you're just going to snap the locking tab. Take it out from the bolt side. And then there's another 17 mil right on the top there. So let's get all those out and then we can get this mount out. Well, it's a good thing I took that mount off because there's another bell housing bolt hidden behind there. And I'm gonna be honest, I had no idea that was there. All right, so I went ahead and took that bolt out. It actually was a 17 mil. And look at that. Our engine and transmission are starting to separate a little bit, which is a good sign. That means they're not seized and stuck together. So now at this point, I'm gonna just start taking all the body clips out on this plastic panel here. And then we can get these splash guards taken off so that we can get at the front bolts on the subframe and we can get ready to drop this thing. Thank you. 
All right, the plastic splash guard is completely off. I'm pretty sure I broke half the body clips, but that's okay, I got more. I just use a flat head just to get them nice and loose. And then you use a panel popper or trim tool kind of body clip thing to get them all the way off. And now that we got that off, look how much room there is for activities under here. We got that one subframe bolt up front. This is the driver's front corner of the car. We already got that mount off in the middle. Then there's one more bolt on the front passenger side of the car. Then on the driver's rear of the subframe, you're gonna have another one. And there's gonna be another one on the passenger rear side of the subframe. And I think we're gonna be able to drop this subframe and leave the power steering rack up connected to the steering column. And I'll show you why. Honda seems like they kind of did us a little little bit of a favor here. So if you look down from the top of the engine bay, you can actually see down there, those two bolts are what bolts the power steering rack to the subframe on the driver's side. It's those two bolts right down there. And that bracket actually looks like it comes off. So you can take that bracket right off. It looks like a 17 mil and possibly a 14 or a 12. Then underneath the car, you can see there's a couple brackets that hold the wiring harness for the power steering rack to the subframe. Just go around and find all those brackets. This one's got, it looks like a 10 mil mounted on the top of it. So I'm gonna get that taken out. Then if you look in from this side, this is the passenger side of the car. There's that one little bracket right there. It's got a bolt on either side and that's what supports the power steering rack on the passenger side of the car. So we're gonna get those two bolts taken out of that bracket, then get this bracket on the driver's side taken off, take off the bolts for the wiring harness mounts and then that power steering rack should realistically be loose and then I should be able to draw the subframe after we take off the one last mount that's on the back of the engine. So let's get that electronic power steering rack disconnected first. Yeah, that bracket comes right out. Sick, thanks Honda. You're making life easier. Nice, now let's get stuff disconnected on the bottom. All right, I finally got the steering rack loose, but there was one bracket that I missed showing you guys at the start that I took off, and I'll show you what I mean. So we took off the bracket that I showed you guys up top here, but that didn't completely loosen this side. So there was actually three brackets that held the electronic power steering rack to the subframe. This is the one that I showed you guys from the top, the one big bolt and one small bolt, bolted it to the subframe on the driver's side. But then on the driver's side, there was also another one right behind that one, and this one kind of sucked to get at, not gonna lie. Then there was the 110 mil holding that wiring harness on that I showed you guys. And that was the only harness you actually had to disconnect because these two bolts held a bracket that held the electronic power steering rack on the passenger side. And there was a bunch of wiring harnesses clipped to these. So once you loosen that bracket, those harnesses will be loose from the subframe as well. So I'll go under and show you guys where this bracket was and how I got them off so that you guys don't struggle with this as much as I did. So looking from the back here, this is right where the exhaust comes out. One of the bolts sat right up here. Then the bracket came down and another one was back down there. So the best way I found to get this off was I went at it from the front of the subframe and for the 14 mil bolt, I basically got a 3 8 ratchet with a little baby extension on there and a 14 mil shallow socket. Came in from the back like this and just threaded it off that way. And then the 17 mil, I was able to get the ratchet right back here just with a 17 mil shallow and this 3 8 ratchet. And it took like 10 minutes to get the one bolt off, but I was able to get it off. Now at this point, we're pretty much ready to take the subframe out. All we gotta do is take this big bolt off of the engine mount. This is the oil pan right here. So we gotta take that bolt out and take this bolt out. Out, that engine mount will be loose and then we can get the subframe dropped. I'm not gonna take this mount out. As long as the bolts are out of there, we should be able to drop the subframe no problem because this is nice and loose. Then on your subframe, there's gonna be six to eight bolts total. Not 100% sure on the side brackets if you have to take both of them out or just one, but I think you just have to take one out so there should be six bolts. You're gonna have the four big ones that I already showed you guys on the bottom of the subframe. Then on the side of the subframe on both sides, you're gonna have two bolts right there. They look like two 17 mils and I'm pretty sure you only have to take the top one out if you have issues with it, you can take both out. I'm gonna get my dad to help me drop the subframe because he's a beauty and he offered. So we're gonna get some jack stands to support this thing and I'm gonna drop the front side down, then start loosening the bolts on the back side so that it'll lower a little bit, get the front on jack stands and then use a jack to lower the back side and then adjust the jack stands and kind of support it with your arms as you go. So I'm just gonna time lapse through this and then after we get the subframe down, I'll show you guys how to get the transmission dropped out. All 
All right, well, that sucks. That did not go the way I wanted it to with that rack. So we got the subframe dropped, but the steering shaft on the rack actually came right out. I thought it was gonna be locked to the steering rack on the steering wheel or the steering column, but uh, she slid right out. That wiring harness though has tons of slack. You can totally drop the rack right on the ground. It does not pull on any of the wires, but this steering shaft literally slid right out of the hole. And I'll show you guys on the inside of the car what it slid out of. That's the shaft right there, right by the clutch pedal. It basically just lines up straight like like that goes through that hole right there and connects to your steering rack shit honestly if i were to do that again i would probably strap the rack to the car but we kind of thought of that after the fact so you guys can learn from my mistakes but we'll figure it out when we get it back together besides the whole power steering rack situation we're gonna get the transmission drop now first thing we got to do is get the engine supported by something so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna use a jack on the bottom i'm gonna get a block of wood and then we're just gonna get the block of wood right onto the oil pan right there jack the engine up just a little bit just to get some weight off of it support it and then for this transmission mount we're gonna take the those two 17 mils out and this 17 mil nut and the other 17 mil nut on the back side back there. That should let this whole transmission mount popped right out unless there's another one under there that I'm unaware of or this stud goes all the way through that. I'm not really sure. Then I'm gonna use the engine crane and we're gonna bolt the engine crane to the transmission in those bolt holes right there. We're gonna slide it over and drop it out the bottom. Sick, look at that, transmission's out. I had a hell of a time with that engine mount. There's actually a bolt on the bottom on the side there, it's a 17 mil. I'll just show you guys the mount here so it makes it easier for you. This is how it sits in the car. So I took these two 17 mils out there, I took the two 17 mil nuts out that bolted to the engine, and I took that off, but realistically you don't need to. That one on the bottom right there sucks. I had to go in from the inner fender with a wrench, kind of like from this angle, and then I just kind of felt around my fingers till I felt it, and then started loosening it off from here. Then I got a pretty sick setup down there with a bunch of blocks of wood to support the engine, and then we just dropped the transmission right onto a cart with a couple blocks of wood. Sweet, thanks. Nice. This throwout bearing is absolutely hammered. I can barely even pull this thing. It's like seized as hell. Let's see if the, fin the fingers are busted. Holy, that is shiny. Sounds horrible. Fingers are still good on it. I guess it was just destroyed because like that sounds bad. What does my clutch fork look like? Yeah, this pin is supposed to sit like that and it was completely popped out. There's a lot of clutch that's in here. I beat on this thing too much. I honestly don't understand why this would lock it out of gear though. The throw bearing is just screwed. There's gotta be something messed up on that pressure plate. What the frick, dude? That spring looks like it came out of the clutch disc and it's been like rubbing on the pressure plate fins. You can see where it's all shiny and glazed. Oh man, we gotta get that pressure plate taken off. One thing I will say I am very, very happy about, the starter does not have to come out. For all you guys that are doing this, don't worry about the top bolt on the starter because as you guys can see right there, it's kind of blurred out, but right where my finger's pointing, that starter bolt bolts into the engine block. You do have to take the bottom one out, but you don't have to take that top one out. So just to show you guys what I did with with the engine crane. I basically had two chains here and then two little hooks. I just put a bolt and a washer through each one. I bolted one to the top of the transmission right here. And then I bolted one right where the slave cylinder mounts up. And that gave us enough room to kind of get a pry bar in between the engine and transmission, separate it, and then just lower the transmission onto this cart. And then I could just easily roll it out, which was nice. Another thing I did forget to mention on the subframe, and I'm gonna try to make the rest of this video quick because I'm pretty sure it's like 35 to 40 minutes already at this point, but I'm trying to be as in depth as I can for you guys. The last thing on the subframe that I missed was the exhaust hanger, which is easy. You guys will see it when you get to it. You just gotta spray some WD-40 on it, get a pry bar and just pop the little exhaust hanger rubber bushing piece off. But other than that, this went pretty good, I think. Now to get this pressure plate off, you just need a 10 mil 12 point socket and we're just gonna zip all the bolts out. All right, what do we got? Oh God, what the shit? I broke my clutch. How the hell did I even do that? Holy, that got hot. Look how blue that is. I freaking broke my clutch. Oh my, I could take the spring right out. What the shit? Nice. All right, let's get a 17 mil 12 point and buzz all these flywheel bolts off. All right. So old clutch, pressure plate, and throw bearing are garbage. Now we get to move on to the new pressure plate, six-putt clutch, 
and I'm gonna reuse my stock flywheel. But I gotta take it to go get it machined tomorrow, so I can't put this in right now. But what I can do today is get everything else cleaned up. Now I got my clutch fork already cleaned up, just sprayed it with some brake clean, wiped everything out, cleaned this lock pin thing off and got that reinstalled. So that's all cleaned up and you can't really see much in there, but I took some brake clean and brake cleaned off the entire engine side of things and just blew it all off with an air hose. Now I gotta clean out the transmission because it is greasy in there. That was kind of satisfying. Got the tranny all cleaned up. All the clutch dust is all cleaned out of the housing. I went and got my flywheel machined. Now we got a nice, smooth, completely straight mating surface for our fresh six puck clutch to mate up to. So now that we got the factory flywheel machined, it's ready to go. If you guys want to buy a new flywheel or a lightweight flywheel or whatever you want to get, if you buy a new one, obviously you don't have to machine it because it is a completely straight surface. But if you're reusing your factory one, you do have to machine it. So next thing we're going to get replaced because it's 10 times easier to do with the flywheel off is we are gonna get this little pilot bushing replaced. And I'll show you guys how to do that. Another thing I will say, if you guys are doing your clutch, it is a good idea to replace your rear main seal while you're here, but I'm not a big fan of replacing what's not broken. This seal's not leaking. It's been bone dry since I've owned the car. So I'm gonna leave this seal in it. Hopefully I don't regret that and hopefully it doesn't start leaking in the next like 10,000 K. So to get your old pilot bushing popped out, all it is is a little bushing that just sits inside the crankshaft right there. That allows your input shaft to kind of idle on inside the crankshaft. So how we're gonna pop that out is you're just gonna need a flathead screwdriver. And this is why I do this with the flywheel off so you can use the crankshaft to pry it out. I like to put a rag over top of the flathead so you're not digging a metal groove into your crankshaft. All you gotta do is get behind the pilot bushing and just pry it out slowly. And make sure you're doing it around the entire surface so you're not etching it up like crazy. All right, we almost got her. Holy shit. So we're gonna get this new pilot bushing set in there. Don't put any lube on the outer surface of it. We're gonna put this in dry. Make sure it's nice and straight. Then we're gonna get our 18 mil socket on there and start tapping it in. You know what? I got it in there so it's round now, but I'm gonna use a 19 mil. The 18 mil seems a little bit too small. You just tap it until it gets to the bottom of the tapered surface on this face of the crankshaft. I'll try and get a close up of what I mean. So on the crankshaft, if you can see what I mean, there's actually a tapered surface there and you basically just pound this pilot bushing until it sits at the bottom of that tapered surface on the crankshaft. And another thing you want to do is make sure that where the pilot bushing separates, the two ends are even with each other. And by that, I mean these two ends right here. Make sure they're not misaligned and make sure they're nice and flush. And ours is in good. So now let's get the flywheel on. And I'm just gonna wind all these in till they're snug and then we'll torque them right after. Now I'll show you guys how to torque them. Because if you try and torque them by yourself right here, if you even try to tighten these, it's just gonna rotate your crankshaft. So you need to hold your crank pulley on the other side. Your crank pulley sits on the passenger side of the car and it's what's bolted to the other side of your crankshaft. So all you're gonna do is get a big wrench with a 19 mil socket. You're gonna stick it on that crankshaft so you can hold it to prevent the engine from rotating when you're torquing down that flywheel. Now just to show you guys bolt torques for the flywheel, we're gonna tighten them in a star pattern and they are all torqued to 90 foot pounds. And I'm gonna put a paint mark on each one that I torque so that I don't go over them twice. Let's start with that one right there. Now let's do that one right there. Okay, flywheel bolts are all torqued up. Now our next step is gonna be to get our clutch and pressure plate on. But before you do that, you always gotta write yourself a little message for next time. Did it again, eh? I had to add the A at the end because I'm Canadian and everyone thinks we say that all the time. Now, before we even go to put this pressure plate on, when these pressure plates are new, they have some oil on the surface that contacts the clutch just so that they don't rust in the packaging. So you're gonna wanna get some brake clean and spray that off and wipe it down. And then just wipe the surface down with a nice clean rag. You see all that? That came off a brand new pressure plate. So make sure you clean that off. Now we're gonna do the same thing on the flywheel. Beautiful, nice and clean. Now we are going to take our new six puck competition stage four clutch. The side where the springs stick out more always goes towards the pressure plate. So we're gonna get the alignment tool, 
slid through the splines on the clutch, and then we're gonna get the alignment tool into the pilot bushing, just like that, and push the clutch forward till it makes contact with the flywheel, and now we can get our pressure plate on. I know I have the writing of a four-year-old. You probably can't even read that. Now that we got the clutch on, we can get our pressure plate on, and there's gonna be a bunch of alignment dowels. There's one, two, three on the flywheel. So we're gonna wanna line those up with the dowel points on the pressure plate. Now we can get our six pressure plate bolts in and get them all threaded in by hand. Now I'm gonna snug these up with my cordless ratchet, but you don't wanna torque them down with this. And when you're snugging them up just to seat the pressure plate, make sure you're going in a star pattern to prevent bending those diaphragm springs. All of these are gonna get torqued to 19 foot pounds. And like I said, just like it shows in that diagram right there, you're gonna do it in a star pattern. And I'm not gonna torque these all right down to 19 foot pounds right away. I'm just gonna tighten them up all in a star pattern just to compress the diaphragm springs against the clutch disc. Now that all the bolts are snugged right up and the spring is completely compressed, we can get them torqued down to 19 foot pounds. And since you are compressing a spring here, I highly recommend just go over all of them one more time, even though you torqued them all, just double check that they're all at 19 foot pounds. All right, I double checked, they're all torqued to 19 foot pounds. Now we can get our clutch alignment tool pulled out of there. Oh, that's the best sound ever. Sick dude, now we gotta clutch again. Now we gotta get our transmission ready to be reinstalled. And to do that, we need to reinstall our clutch fork and our new thrall bearing. So the way this clutch fork works is there's this spring that sits inside of it that holds it to this pivot ball right here on the transmission. And that pivot ball sits in this surface of the clutch fork with the clutch fork in there just like that. So the way that it locks it on is you are going to stick this pin through the clutch fork down there, and then you're gonna lock each tab into the hole on the clutch fork just like that. Now this is gonna expand around that pivot ball and lock it on the back side. But before you get this on, you're gonna wanna grease a couple points on the clutch fork, on this input shaft sleeve, and on the thrill bearing. So I got some high temp synthetic, just AMSOIL grease here. Usually these kits come with grease. I'm not really sure why mine didn't. Maybe competition clutch just forgot to put grease in this packet. But for you guys, I would advise if the kit came with grease, use the grease that came with your clutch kit. But this is the same stuff they put in the clutch kits, so that's why I'm using this. So first thing you're gonna get greased up is going to be this pivot ball inside of the transmission. And you're basically greasing all of the contact points. Anything that is metal on metal, you wanna have a layer of grease on there. Next thing I'm gonna grease up is the inside of this throwout bearing because it glides on that transmission sleeve right behind the input shaft there. And keep in mind when you're applying this grease that Anywhere that happens on your clutch creates dust and dust tends to stick to grease. So if you put a lot of grease in one area, there is gonna be a lot of clutch dust collecting wherever that grease is. So grease it up nice, but don't go too crazy. And I'm just gonna put a little layer of grease right where that pivot ball sits in the clutch fork. Then you're also gonna put some grease on the clutch fork little fingers, and then we're gonna put some grease on the actual fingers on the throwout bearing. So now when installing this clutch fork, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get the top side of the clutch fork slid in through the hole in the bell housing of the transmission. We're gonna slide our throwout bearing on, slide the fingers of the throwout bearing onto the fingers of the clutch fork, and then the throwout bearing should glide onto that input put shaft nicely. Now you basically just find the center point of the ball on the clutch fork and then you're just gonna push forward and it'll click right in. Just like that. Now our clutch fork is locked in. Our throwout bearing glides super nice. Then I like to put a little bit of grease on the input shaft just to help it slide into the clutch disc a little bit nicer. And then I also put a little bit of grease just on the portion of the input shaft that sits on your pilot bushing. And actually while I'm at it, I'm gonna get this clutch boot reinstalled onto the outside of the transmission. Mint. And honestly, now that we got that throw bearing on and greased up, we got the clutch on. I've pretty much gone through all the how-to stuff so far. Reinstalling this is basically just reverse of the removal procedure. So I feel like I did a decent job explaining how to do this. If I didn't, let me know in the comments down below. If you guys have any questions, don't feel afraid to ask. I always try to answer every single comment that is on this channel. So if this video helped you guys out, make sure you're dropping a like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. With all that being said, let's just time lapse through the rest of this. I'll stop 
at important points like torques for the axle nut. Everything else is just gonna be nice and tight with either the impact gun or just hand tight with a ratchet. So yeah, let's get this transmission back in the car. Sick, transmission's in. That kind of sucked to do by myself, not gonna lie. But I kind of used a jack to angle the back side and then I used the engine hoist to lift up the front side and then just kind of wiggled it. If you guys are having issues meeting up the input shaft into the clutch disc and the transmission just won't set into the engine nicely, try rotating your crankshaft a little bit just to turn the splines on the clutch disc. Maybe they're misaligned with the transmission or something like that. I had to do it and then it popped on perfectly. Just make sure that your clutch fork moves freely back and forth and now, it barely moves up and down. Whereas before, I could literally grab this thing and shake it up and down like crazy. This one's not like a Subaru. This isn't a lock-in style throw-up bearing. On a Subaru, you gotta pull this and lock the throw-up bearing to the pressure plate fins. But in this one, it's just a free-flowing throw-up bearing. It just pushes in the fins on the pressure plate to disengage the clutch. So now let's get the subframe back in, get these other two engine mounts bolted back up and get the power steering rack back in, which is gonna suck. But again, it's the same as the removal procedure. Just reverse that, get it all back in, and let's time lapse through the rest of this. So I got pretty much everything on the bottom of the car buttoned up. Both axles are in, subframes up, everything's bolted up. I ended up actually having to drill out the cotter pins in the tie rods and then I put new ones in. I just used a punch to punch them out as much as I could. This one I was able to punch out and then the other side I had to drill with the drill bit. But I got new cotter pins in, they're all good now. And up top, I got all the linkage connected. I got the two top bell housing bolts in. I got everything on up top that can go on at this point. And the next step, that I gotta do is torque the axle nut. Now, out of all the bolts that you need to torque, your axle nut is probably the most important. So let's do that quick. Torquing your axle nut on SI models is gonna be 181 foot-pounds. On non-SI Civics, it's gonna be 134 foot-pounds. So we're gonna do 181 foot-pounds. Now, if you go to torque your axle nut, you're just gonna spin the rotor. So what I do is I take a flathead screwdriver, shove it in the rotor, whichever way it's gonna be rotating, start tightening it up. Now your screwdriver is gonna hit the caliper and you can get this torque to 181 foot-pounds. Perfect. Big screwdriver out, do the same thing on the other side. Now once you get those torques, you're gonna find the slot on your axle and you're gonna restake that axle nut. I just use a punch and a hammer. Find that spot and just punch it in. And it should look something like that once you restake it. Now that I got those axle nuts restaked, torqued up, everything on the bottom is 100% done. I'm gonna get the wheels back on the car and I'm gonna drop it on the ground so I can get everything else up top reassembled. One thing I will say, if you guys are doing this, it's a good idea to change your transmission fluid at the same time. I don't have any Honda manual transmission fluid on me and I didn't lose that much fluid, so I'm gonna change it on a later day. But if you guys wanna do that, I'll probably have a video coming out soon on how to change the transmission fluid on this thing. So let's get the wheels back on get this thing off jacks, and then let's start reassembling the top. All right, so we got everything completely finished, pretty much. The only thing I don't have on is my battery mount and the J-hooks because they were rusty as hell, so I wanted to paint them. So I sanded those down, primed them, sanded them again, and then hit them with a coat of gloss black. So I gotta wait for those to dry to get those back on. Now we're pretty much done. I'm gonna fire it up and see what happens. And then once I start it and we know that everything's all good and the clutch works, I'm gonna go inside and adjust the clutch pedal free play. And if you don't know what that is, when you order a clutch from Competition Clutch, they actually give you instructions on 
on how to adjust it. Basically, all you gotta do is loosen a lock nut on the clutch pedal, adjust it till you have about half an inch of free play in the clutch pedal. And free play in your clutch pedal is basically just the amount of play you have before your clutch pedal gets hard to push. Wow, I can't even push that with my hands. This thing's gonna be stiff. I've literally done so many clutches, I still get scared every time on the first start. So to adjust your clutch pedal free play, you're gonna hop under the dash down here. And the first thing you're gonna do is loosen this little wing nut clip right here on this trim panel. And then you're basically just gonna pull this whole bottom kick panel off. Now that we got that to the side, we can see our clutch pedal adjustments right here. You have your clutch pedal release switch here, and your free play adjustment is the lock nut on the back back here. All right, so competition clutches instructions tell you to disconnect these connectors, which I don't really understand why, because they're not in the way. So we're gonna start on step five. You're gonna take a 17 mil wrench, and you're going to loosen off this lock nut on the lower clutch pedal switch. Oh, that's why you gotta disconnect the connectors because to loosen this, it's gonna spin the wires like crazy. So I'm gonna get this connector disconnected. You're basically just gonna spin this switch out until the threads are completely flush with the backside. There we go, we are flush right there. Now just to hold this in place, I'm just gonna tighten that lock nut up by hand. Now this little orange piece right here is called your forward stop. So what we're gonna do now is we are going to adjust the push rod on the back on the master cylinder back there until that yellow forward stop piece is actually just contacting this bracket that mounts the clutch pedal switch. So you're gonna take a 12 mil wrench and you're gonna get on the lock nut way back there and you're gonna loosen that off. Once you crack it loose, you can spin that nut back by hand a little bit and now it's dialed back. So now what we're gonna do, like I said before, we're gonna thread that push rod until this yellow piece here is just contacting the bracket. Because you guys can't see on camera, but there's actually about a quarter of an inch gap when this clutch pedal comes all the way up to the bracket. So we gotta adjust it out a bit. And the way I'm gonna do that is with a little piece of vice grips like this. I don't know why manufacturers don't put a little nut on the push rod for you to adjust it with. They always make your life difficult, so you gotta use a pair of vice grips or pliers or something like that to rotate it. And this is gonna be the most difficult part of this whole job. But basically what you're gonna do, I'm not gonna show this because it's gonna be way too hard, but you're basically just gonna get the vice grips, clamp them very lightly on that push rod right there, and then you're gonna rotate it. And depending which direction you need to go, because I'm not really sure if it's going in or out, but just adjust it whichever way you need to spin it till this little yellow piece here is contacting that bracket. Okay, so I adjusted that push rod until this clutch pedal is just barely contacting the bracket. And with that adjustment, Actually, they want a half inch of free play here. And if you guys look at the clutch pedal here, that's about a half an inch. You can see where I'm starting and stopping. That feels like about a half an inch to me, so I think we're good right there. Now, since we got our free play set, you're gonna go ahead and re-tighten up that lock nut on the back there. Just thread it in all the way by hand until it stops. Then take your 12 mil wrench and snug it up. Now this is gonna be hard to show because I gotta watch. But now you're gonna loosen off the lock nut on this lower clutch pedal switch. And you're gonna watch underneath here and just thread it in until it contacts that yellow piece on the clutch, which is right there. Now I can tighten this lock nut up with my 17 mil. Snug that up. Now we're going to adjust this upper switch with the yellow connector. So let's get that unplugged. How the hell are you supposed to get on that one? It seems like the easiest thing to do to me. We're gonna take this lower switch right out just because I don't have a tool to get in there on that upper switch. Now that we got the lower switch out, we can get that upper one off. Get that lock nut backed out. Now for this upper switch, how you're gonna adjust that is on step 11 of the instructions. And this one's gonna be kinda hard. You can kinda feel it with your fingers if you get up there. But what I'm gonna do is just push your clutch pedal all the way down, spin that upper switch until you feel it hit the clutch. And you can shove your fingers back there and feel it a little bit. And mine's gonna be pretty much bottomed, holy smokes. So I'm gonna shove my finger in there, feel when it comes fully depressed, and right there it's hitting. So now let's get that upper switch lock nut snugged up. Now I'm just gonna double check and make sure that adjustment's still good, which it is. Now let's get the lower switch reinstalled. And then again on this one, we're gonna thread it just until it contacts that push stop on the clutch pedal. Plug both of our electrical connectors back in. And now our clutch pedal adjustment is done. 
Now let's just get this trim panel reinstalled. Mint. Now before I adjusted that clutch pedal, I was actually getting a little bit of grinding going into reverse. Like if I would put the car in first gear, move forward a little bit, let the clutch out, then put it in reverse, it would grind going into reverse and it wasn't engaging properly. Now I adjusted that clutch pedal and it is absolute butter. It feels so good. And this clutch pedal actually feels pretty good. It's not that heavy. I mean, it's a lot heavier than stock, but it's not as bad as I thought it'd be. So I'll show you guys what I mean about it being buttery going into gear. So we'll go clutch pedal in, put it in reverse, We'll move forward a little bit, and now we can just take it and toss it right in reverse, no grinding whatsoever. We can move through the gears like crazy, and there's no grinding. Whereas before, if I would put it in first, move forward, and then toss it in reverse, it would grind a little bit going into reverse. Now that that clutch pedal adjustment's done, we got everything completely finished up. I even got this battery mount painted and bolted back up. So she is finally done, baby. Sick, let's take it for a rip. Ah, oh, shit. We are like 60 degrees to the left on this steering wheel. So I'm gonna take a mental note of how far off the steering wheel is, and then we're gonna go in the shop, pop the steering wheel off, and recenter it. All right, so that's about how crooked my steering wheel was. Now I'm gonna get this thing pulled off. All there is, if you look on the side of the steering wheel here, there's one on either side. There's just a T30 Torx bolt there. So we're gonna get those two taken off to get the airbag off. Then once you get those two T30 Torx bolts out, they look like this on either side. There's gonna be an electrical connector on the bottom under a little plastic trim panel. It's for the airbag. You're gonna wanna unplug that. All you gotta do is just pull that black slider pin back and it'll unplug. Now this whole airbag should be loose and should come off nice and easy. Now now I gotta get that ground for the airbag taken off. All you gotta do to disconnect that ground is just push that little tab and this will slide right off. Now we are going to disconnect this other connector here for the clock spring and then I'm gonna take that bolt off and we're gonna get the steering wheel flipped up to the straight position again. All right, so I got this connector disconnected from the clock spring, took that 14 mil bolt out, walked the steering wheel a couple times on either side and now she should come off. So I have this set about as crooked as it was before. So now I'm gonna get the steering wheel taken off and now my clock spring was set nice and crooked where it was before. So I'm just gonna reset the clock spring straight and now I'm gonna get the steering wheel put on as straight as possible and we'll see how close we got it I'm probably still gonna need to do an alignment on it but the reason you are able to do this and not do an alignment just pop the steering wheel off and move it is because we did not touch our tie rod the tie rods are still at the same adjustment they were before so all we are changing is the mesh with the steering column to the steering rack itself because our steering rack fell on the ground so let's get this back on take it for another drive and see how straight it is hey check that out I eyeballed it and I got it first try she's perfectly straight now sick I can't believe I got that first try. Got the steering wheel back on and it fits perfect. I just eyeballed that and then put the steering wheel back on straight, clock spring straight, and it is perfectly straight. That was lucky though. I'm still probably gonna do an alignment on it. But now that we got this thing finally all finished up, that is gonna be it for this video. I know this video was like probably honestly close to an hour long, but I tried to be as in-depth as I could for you guys if you guys are seeing this and you're trying to do this yourself. It's not that bad of a job. It does take a long time, but it is doable for you DIY guys. So if this video help you guys out make sure you guys are leaving a like on the video make sure you guys are smashing that subscribe button because it helps me out gives me motivation to keep making videos we got way more stuff coming for the subaru that thing's gonna make like 550 600 wheel maybe this summer on e85 so yeah peace out you guys thanks for watching i will catch you in the next one